I'm joined by Julia Galef. Julia, welcome. Hey, great to be here. So we're talking because you've just published a book called The Scout Mindset, why some people see things clearly and others don't. Your background, as I understand it, you were instrumental in setting up the very influential Centre for Applied Rationality, and you've been part of the rationalist movement for a long time. Just maybe before we go into the book, could you just summarise what is the rationalist movement for those maybe who are not familiar with it? Uh, Well, this will take up half of our interview, so I hope you're fine with that. Uh, So the rationalist movement is a a community that originally popped up online about 10 to 15 years ago, in the early 2000s, um, around two blogs, uh, one less wrong and one overcoming bias. And the kind of defining theme of both blogs was rationality, um, which is Uh, It has a colloquial meaning, but in this case, the reference was an academic meaning of the term. Um, And it has two parts. One is epistemic rationality, which is about uh, methods of forming more accurate beliefs about the world, um, finding truth, essentially. How do you reason and evaluate evidence such that your beliefs are more accurate? And the other meaning is instrumental rationality, which is how do you make decisions to more effectively achieve your goals, whatever your goals are. Um, And so the, the blogs were just about how to get better at epistemic and instrumental rationality and kind of the philosophy and the science around rationality. So it was just a community of people interested in epistemic and instrumental rationality um, and understanding them better and getting better at practicing them. Um, And so the term rationality community and rationalists uh, got, I don't know if there was any official definition or decision to call the community that, but that's what we ended up being called. Um, And it's unfortunate because the rationalist community tends to sound to people like, oh, so you're saying you think you're all perfectly rational and other people aren't, Um, which is not, was never the intended meaning and is kind of really counter to what rationalists actually believe, which is that no, humans are all irrational. And the best we can do is try to become a little less irrational, like less wrong. (laughs) It is in the name of the blog. Um, But but I can see why it comes off to people that way. And it's a misconception that I've sort of forever... (laughs) Uh, butting my head against. It's fair to say that the the rationalist community is has an outsized influence on. It's very influential in Silicon Valley. It's very appealing to a lot of people who are trying to make sense of the world better, which is why I think it's a really significant. Um, it's a really important thing I think for people to understand if they're trying to make sense of the world as well. Um, and your book obviously is kind of summarising a lot of your experience and a lot of what you learnt and your passions from that time. Um, the scout mindset, why some people see things clearly and others don't. I'm going to start off by saying, isn't the problem that we all think we think we see things clearly and others don't? Isn't that kind of the, the main bias that we all wrestle with? Yeah, so it's you'll find lots of people who say, you know, yes, of course, my views are already clear and the problem is just getting other people to see things clearly. Um, that's a very natural way to feel um, because our our own errors and biases are just much less visible to us than other people's errors and biases. Um, So part of the challenge and and part of what I'm trying to do in the book is just get people to become more aware of, oh, yeah, even though it kind of feels like I'm always being rational and and objective, um, I'm actually not. And I can, I can like learn to notice and, and overcome some of those biases. Um, So self-awareness is, is part of the goal. Um, But then I, I think, Even though on some level people will say, you know, yes, of course, I already see see things clearly. If you if you ask them about it in more detail, they'll often say, actually, I don't think I don't think I do see things fully clearly. And I don't think people should. There's a lot of explicit opposition to the idea of trying to have accurate beliefs um, in a lot of contexts. So, for example, a lot of people will say, you know, it's much better to see things positively than to see things accurately. You know, if you have an unrealistically positive view of yourself or your life or um, the world, that's actually good. You shouldn't try to change that um, because that's what keeps you happy and motivated and uh, so on. So so that's one of a set of kind of hesitations about scout mindset that uh, that I think prevents people from trying to see things as clearly as they otherwise could. Um, And so the book is also aimed at addressing those. Yeah, because that's one of the questions that comes up. One of the points that comes up is, did we evolve to understand the truth? A a friend of mine tweeted yesterday, 
we're social or we're tribal before we're rational. And I think you address that in the book, like the question as to whether we actually did evolve to, to, to perceive things truly or we evolved to perceive things as our tribe wants us to perceive them or as kind of more of a social cues. What's your belief on that? Maybe I should just, for context, explain the metaphor of the book, the scout versus soldier metaphor. Um, so these are my terms for concepts that are already well well studied and well, you're, I'm sure people are already familiar with them by different names. Um, but what I call soldier mindset is uh, in the cognitive science literature called directionally motivated reasoning. Um, and it's essentially reasoning aimed at defending a particular predetermined conclusion. So you're, what you're really trying to do, although you may not be consciously aware of it when you're in soldier mindset, is to um, defend some pre-existing belief that you have or defend something that you want to believe. Um, and this can be, uh, it can be relevant when you're thinking about politics. You know, you're more likely to try to find flaws in, in arguments about politics that you don't like and more likely to, ju to just unquestioningly accept arguments you do like, things like that. Of course, it also applies to our personal lives. You're more, more likely to um, find justifications for things that you want to do or, you know, justifications for why your own life choices make sense and other people's don't. Um, so this soldier mindset applies at all levels and it's universal and seems to be just sort of part of how the human mind works. Um, and then scout mindset is an alternative way of thinking, which we sometimes engage in and which I think we could and should engage in more. Uh, and it's an alternative because the scout's role, unlike the soldier, is not to attack or defend. Um, it's just to go out and see what's really out there as clearly as possible um, and form as accurate a map of a situation or an issue as possible including all of the unknowns and uncertainties. Like your map should have a bunch of question marks on it and it should be written in pencil so you can erase it and revise it instead of in pen. Um, and in scout mindset, you, you actively want to learn what you're wrong about uh, to make your map more accurate. Unlike in soldier mindset, when learning that you're wrong is like a defeat. Um, so these are my two metaphors. And as you alluded to, um, part of the interesting question here is why humans are so often in soldier mindset? Why is this so often our default mode of thinking? And I think a lot of it, although not, not all of it, has to do with uh, what you mentioned, the kind of tribal aspects of thinking, that to a large extent, the, the purpose of our reasoning as it evolved, it does not seem to be helping us figure out truth. It seems to be helping us believe things that will make us more socially successful and thereby more genetically successful. Like if we can believe things that, that help us signal to our fellow tribe members that we are, we're one of the team, you know, we believe the things that make you a loyal and a, a virtuous and, and wise person, um, then that'll, you know, help us succeed in life. And it doesn't necessarily matter if those things are true. Um, so obviously I, I think that, you know, we're better off if we can shift more towards scout mindset and less towards soldier mindset. But I, I do think at the same time, it's very understandable why we fall into these patterns. Um, they didn't come out of nowhere that we don't think like this because we're, you know, idiots or, or, you know, evil or anything like that. Um, it's like a, an understandably evolved part of our brain, but nevertheless, one that I think is worth pushing back on. And there's an interesting, um, nuance to this because the question is to as to whether that's getting worse are we getting more and more pushed into soldier mindset for example by the tech platforms there's a there's a whole school of thought to do with tristan harris and the um kind of social dilemma ne netflix documentary i'm sure people will be aware of i mean his perspective is that because we're being manipulated increasingly by these platforms we're being pushed more and more into what we already know and more and more into this sort of tribal way of thinking. Do you think that that's, do you think it's getting worse or, or not? I suspect it's getting at least a little worse. I mean, it's, it's hard to avoid that conclusion when you, when you spend time online. Um, so one, one way in which I think social media and, and the internet just more broadly makes this process worse is that it kind of, brings to our attention the most aggravating and annoying examples of people on the other side of whatever your position is. And, and so that tends to put us into soldier mindset because A, it just riles us up and it's easier to be in soldier mindset when you're, you know, really angry or outraged. 
And it's and fun. It's also fun to be in there. It is. And that's, I mean, that's one reason we are, our engagement with social media platforms tends to go up when they show us a lot of outraging news or, um, or posts from the other side. So that it makes sense that they would have an incentive to do that. Um, but the, the other way in which I think this phenomenon makes soldier mindset worse, that's maybe a little less obvious is that I think that when you see, when you're encount, um, uh, confronted with a lot of examples of the other side being completely unreasonable, um, you tend to, to use that as a baseline against which to set your own level of reasonableness. So you, you tend to, to think to yourself, well, you know, look, look what irrational idiots the people on the right are. Um, that makes me all the more confident that my side is completely right and virtuous and good and, and so on. And no, that doesn't actually follow. Like, even if the other side is more wrong or more evil than your side, that doesn't automatically make your side right about everything. But I, I, I think that that's kind of a leap that we tend to make. Um, so it makes us more convinced that our side is right and above, uh, you know, above criticism because we're looking at terrible examples from the other side. Um, and, and people also just seem less willing to apply any scrutiny to their own beliefs because they're like, well, the other side's not doing it. So why should I? Uh, as if it's some kind of contract <laughs> that you have to uphold as opposed to, you know, something that you should want to do regardless of what other people are doing because you want to have accurate beliefs. So I think there's a bunch of things going on there. But yeah, my sense is that probably things are are getting worse. But to add a note of optimism to that, um, a way in which things are getting better is that the internet has allowed people to find each other who who otherwise wouldn't have been able to find each other um, and kind of form unofficial communities or subcultures devoted to scout mindset online. So, you know, if in the past you, you know, an unusually truth-seeking uh, intellectually honest thinker about politics had just, you know, you didn't have the internet and you were just surrounded by your peers at, you know, home and work and in, in, in your section of society who are not interested in being scouts about politics and, you know, just wanted to rail about the other side, you kind of either would have fallen into that yourself or just sort of, you know, bowed out and been like, well, this politics stuff is pretty terrible and no one can think about it well. Um, but now you can go online and find other people who want to talk about things with nuance and, you know, want to understand the other side instead of straw manning it, et cetera. And so you can actually do that in a way that you couldn't before the Internet. So I think this is a silver lining of of the way that the Internet lets like minded people find each other um, and and allows for lots of different sources of news. It can lead to a lot of terrible um, feedback loops that feed soldier mindset, but it can also help people practice scout mindset in a way they couldn't before. Something I really like about, since I started kind of looking at a lot of the, the rationalist work, I really like the focus on practice and techniques. Um, you go through a few of those in the book. What do you think are some really good kind of practices and techniques that people can start using? Yeah, well, I mentioned self-awareness a few minutes ago and the importance of cultivating self-awareness and learning to notice, you know, oh, I'm not as, my reasoning isn't as automatically objective as it might feel to me on the surface. And so one family of techniques that I think help cultivate that are thought experiments. Um, a simple familiar example of a thought experiment people might already know would be, um, suppose a politician on your side does something, you know, controversial is coming under criticism for it. And, and your reaction is, oh, whatever, people are making a big deal out of this. You know, they're just trying to, they're just looking for an excuse to take him down, but it's not really a big deal. A thought experiment you could do is to imagine, well, what if a politician on the other side, the, the side that I hate, um, did the same thing? What would my reaction be in that case? Um, and often the, the answer, if you're being honest with yourself, is like, oh, you know, if someone from the other side did that, I would be calling for his head. I'd be saying, you know... This is a, a resignation-worthy offense. And additionally, it just proves how terrible and corrupt that whole side really is. Um, and so the general form here of a thought experiment is just mentally varying the features of the topic at hand or, or you know, the situation at hand to kind of test whether you're applying a different standard uh, to, to the case at hand in a way that kind of protects your own side or your own beliefs, et cetera. 
Um, so there's other there's other variations, um, but that's that's the basic idea: is doing thought experiments to kind of test the objectivity of your own reasoning. Um, and I think doing that on a regular basis really helps you notice, like, oh, my initial judgments are not necessarily as objective as they seem. Mm. Uh, any other techniques that people can play with? Yeah, so a different kind of technique is something is focused on the goal of making yourself more receptive to thinking about inconvenient or unpleasant possible truths. Um, so one thing that I do a lot and that has helped me is before I think about whether some inconvenient possibility might be true, like, you know, did I screw up this project and now I'm going to have to, you know, cut my losses and apologize to people or, or, you know, even more minor on an everyday basis. Like, Oh, am I wrong? Like this argument that I'm having on Twitter, are they right? (laughs) Um, that would be inconvenient for me if that were true. Um, those kinds of questions are very hard to think about and, and give us a real incentive to be in soldier mindset because we don't want to be forced to conclude that the inconvenient thing is true. Um, and so, a technique that I find helpful is before I start thinking about whether the thing is true, I instead ask myself, okay, suppose it was true. Suppose I did screw up this project or suppose I am wrong about this issue I'm arguing about online. Um, How bad would that be? Um, And what would I do? Like, how would I deal with it? Uh, And so the goal is to, A, just like get a little more comfortable with the possibility that you might, the bad thing might be true. And B, form at least sort of a crude rudimentary plan for what you would do in response. Um, Because having a a plan, even a very basic, almost obvious plan, makes bad possibilities seem much less frightening um, or or stressful. So for the being wrong online example, uh, that process might look like, okay, suppose I was wrong, how bad would that be and what would I do? Um, Well, for how bad that would be, I mean, I flinch away from the idea of admitting I'm wrong online. But in fact, I've done that before and it's been fine. Um, And most people have sort of appreciated the intellectual honesty. So I guess it wouldn't actually be that bad, um, even though it felt bad when I first, when the thought first popped into my mind. Um, And as for the plan, like, okay, here's, I can sort of think of how I would say it online, like the words that I would use to tell the person they were right and I was wrong. Um, so I kind of have like a tweet draft in my mind if I need to use it. And, and so now I feel like, okay, it would, I, I would be fine if I turned out to be wrong. It's not that big of a deal. And now I'm kind of free to go back to the original question of, am I wrong? And think about it much more honestly, because it feels like it would be fine if the answer turned out to be yes, or if the answer turned out to be no, I'd be fine. And that's the state you want to be in, in order to think kind of, clearly and and intellectually honestly about a question is feeling like either way I could cope with whatever the truth is. Um, So that's, it might sound like it takes a long time when I describe it, but really it just happens in the, you know, course of 10 seconds in my mind or five seconds. um, And it, it kind of relaxes me intellectually enough to, you know, approach a question with fresh eyes. And in, in one of the reviews for the book, it mentioned that there's quite a few books on rationality coming out at the same time. And uh, Arnold King suggested that we're in an ep- Kling, sorry, um, suggested we're in an epistemic crisis. Do you think we are? Do you understand what he means by that? And, and do you agree? Uh, I don't know the context for that particular quote, but I think there have been a bunch of books kind of loosely on rationality uh, coming out steadily over the last 15 years or so. Um, but the nature of the books is changing. So back in 2005 to 2010, there were a bunch of books like Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, um, uh, why, why People Believe Stupid Things or Why Smart People Believe Stupid Things by Michael Shermer. Um, and those books were were really focused on the kind of cognitive biases and and logical fallacies aspect of thinking and kind of pointing out all the ways in which the human brain is is irrational which is great and and I um I got a lot out of those books and they really influenced me um but 
the kind of newer wave of books on rationality is different for a couple reasons. Um, first, I think because the field of behavioral economics and cognitive science has kind of taken a beating um, in the public eye recently because so much of the kind of celebrity research in those fields has been either it fails to replicate, um, like people try to repeat the experiment, but they don't find the same effect. Or in some cases, uh, turns out to be actively fraudulent. <laughs> like the most recent example that fits this trend is Dan Ariely, the author of Predictably Irrational. Uh, one of his kind of landmark studies was discovered just about a month ago to be based on fraudulent data. And that doesn't prove that he committed the fraud, but definitely someone did in the study, you know, had to be retracted. So I think I think there's less appetite now than there was 10, 15 years ago for, you know, scientifically proving through studies that people are irrational. Um, and then, you know, compared to 2010, now in 2020, there's much more emphasis on the kind of tribal uh, uh, partisan aspects of our thinking, because that's just become so much more salient with the rise of social media and the, you know, the the Trump versus anti-Trump um, divisions in politics. And so I think people are a lot more interested in that now um, than in just the standard cognitive biases. But my kind of break from the rationality books of the early 2000s is a little different. Um, for me, it's it's more about uh, I tended to feel like those earlier books were focusing too much on the cognitive aspect of reasoning. Um, like, here's a bunch of knowledge about cognitive biases and logical fallacies. Um, and, you know, the implication was you can use that knowledge to be a better thinker yourself. Uh, and I, I tended to feel increasingly, the, the more I read and the more I kind of ran workshops and, and, uh, tried to train people and tried to train myself, um, I increasingly felt like this was neglecting a much more important um, bottleneck in human reasoning and judgment improvement, which is the motivational side of things. So, you know, your raw intelligence or how much knowledge you have about a particular field is only one factor. The other factor is how are you motivated to use that intelligence and knowledge? Um, because, you could be motivated to use intelligence knowledge to get the right answer um, if you're in scout mindset, or you could be motivated to use it to defend your pre-existing beliefs. And we see this a lot online. Like I'm sure your viewers are familiar with the trope of the guy who has memorized all, you know, 121 cognitive biases, but he only ever uses those as like a weapon with which to beat his opponents over the head. Uh, and he's, he delights in like point, pointing out flaws in other people's logical reasoning, but never actually applies that lens to his own reasoning to notice things he might be wrong about. And so, you know, you can think about this as like the, the fire hose and like what direction you're pointing the fire hose. It's like two separate axes. And there was so much attention being put on the first axis and very little put on the second axis. And the second axis seemed, if, you know, if anything, more important to me. And so uh, that was part of my goal in writing the Scout Mindset is to focus on the motivation behind our thinking and not just like the power of the thinking itself. Mm. And so that, that do you think that's what makes your book different from a lot of the, the books that have come out so far because it's focused on that motivational aspect? That's one big thing. Um, I guess another thing would be, you know, another big thread running through all of these other books about reasoning was focusing on the ways our reasoning fails. Um, and my book does talk about that a little bit when I'm talking about soldier mindset. But the main focus of the book is looking at ways our reasoning can go right. Like looking at a bunch of examples of people be successfully being in scout mindset in cases where most people would really struggle with that, like demonstrating admirable intellectual honesty about politics or about, you know, a personal challenge, um, confronting a hard truth uh, or, or staying objective, even when the temptation to be in denial is really strong. Um, so looking at all of those examples and asking, you know, what are they doing right? <laughs> what enables people to rise above, you know, these very human tendencies that we all have um, when we do successfully rise above them? What can we learn from that? And, and what, you know, best practices can we adopt to become better scouts? So it was just also taking a different lens on the issue um, and, ask, and asking, you know, what can we learn from the times we get things right instead of the times we get things wrong? Just two sides of the coin. 
Are you familiar with kind of the developmental thinking, um, like Robert Keegan, for example? Um, the whole the whole school is is there's some controversy around it because they there's there's some sense of like are they is it imposing a sort of value system on on people and are they culturally specific or are they genuinely kind of scientific? Uh, but Robert Keegan being an example and then. Spiral dynamics being another one, kind of that was connected to the Integral Institute, but there, there seem at least to be some overlaps. Because Robert Keegan, for example, talks about socialized mind and then self-authoring mind, and that we go through processes of effectively kind of defaulting to the the social environment, and then we we can kind of grow and develop to become more self-directed uh, as as time goes on. Are you familiar with those ways of thinking, and do they overlap? I'm a little familiar. Um, not an expert. I, I guess my reaction to to both the the Keegan, what's it called, Keegan's levels of. Yeah, um, I, I, I'd say levels of development. I think I might get, I might be getting that wrong. Yeah. So my my reaction to both Keegan's levels of development and the spiral dynamics stuff was, you know, this is an interesting framework. Um, I can see how it describes some things and I can, yeah, I I can sort of see how some aspects of human psychology that I'm familiar with kind of fit into them. Uh, I, you know, there are a lot of frameworks you could come up with for, to kind of categorize human psychology that would feel to me like similarly descriptive as, as Keegan's or the spiral, spiral dynamics. And so I, where I get off the train is is when people kind of see them as more definitive or or like uniquely true um, than other frameworks one could use because um, I don't you know it's not like they've been super well tested or anything like that I'm aware of as far as I can tell they were just kind of invented by a dude and you know, he was like, well, look, this seems kind of to describe things to me. And that's fine. That's like a fine way to, to reason about the world. But it's, I don't think it deserves the the epistemic status of being this like, true definitive uh, property of human psychology. Um, you've probably heard the expression, uh, all models are false, but some models are useful. Or maybe, maybe I'm saying it wrong. But yeah, the yeah, the idea is like, I think it's fine to use frameworks like these, even if they aren't super well tested or, you know, rigorously proven or anything like that. I think it's fine to like use them as lenses to observe the world and try them on and kind of see what they cause you to notice. But I, I think to, to give them, to elevate them to higher epistemic status than that would require a lot more evidence than I think we have. Um, so that's my like high level. Also, I guess one more thing I'll add is just that with the Keegan levels, uh, I tend to notice people using them to create hierarchies that I don't think are helpful or even warranted, like putting some people above other people in reasoning ability or, I don't know, personal development or enlightenment. And and I wonder if that's maybe some of the appeal that you get to like cate- like rank people uh, in terms of their enlightenment level. And and I don't really I don't really buy that that's fair or helpful. So yeah, it's. It's a, a well-known, especially of integral theory, it's a well-known phenomenon that as soon as anyone discovers those levels, they immediately put themselves at the top and start kind of judging everyone else. Well, to to the credit of my friends who are into Keegan's stuff, they often don't put themselves at the top. Um, they'll, you know, leave themselves some room to, to rise. But, but I, nevertheless, I still think the impulse to kind of rank people relative to each other is not helpful. I mean, the reason I brought that up, I guess, is because you were talking about that it seems that some people you use the example in the book of the people who've done this right, who seem to be able to kind of. um, So did you find any commonalities in terms of why some people are able to to exhibit those qualities and why others aren't? Yeah. So first, I'll just add that, you know, it's not like anyone is a perfect scout who who always sees the truth and reasons objectively, you know, we're all a mix of soldier and scout and, and there are different aspects to scout mindset too. And you, someone could be really great at one and not so good at another. So like for me, uh, or in my case, I think I'm quite good at, um, 
being fair-minded when it comes to politics or other kind of abstract intellectual questions. Um, I mean, not perfect, but still, I think I'm like much better than average at noticing ways in which my view is flawed and, you know, noticing area, acknowledging areas of uncertainty in my beliefs and things like that. I am less good at the aspect of scout mindset that is focused on, uh, facing bad news about your life or yourself. <laughs> and I really, I struggle more with, you know, resisting the impulse to avoid criticism or avoid thinking about bad things. So point is, the, the people, the examples I give in the book that are kind of exemplars of scout mindset doesn't mean those people are perfect scouts in every way. It just means like they're really, they, they really shine in at least one aspect of, of being a scout. Um, and that's worth highlighting. So to your question about uh, commonalities, uh, there were a number of commonalities. One that comes to mind is, you know, scout mindset is often a little bit difficult, like cognitively or emotionally difficult. Um, and a commonality in the successful scouts I've seen is that to counteract that difficulty, they kind of pride themselves on being good scouts. And they may not use that word, of course, um, but but they pride themselves on having the kind of courage or um, or intellectual honor to be able to acknowledge things that are not necessarily not necessarily flattering to them or to their views. And so what that does is in that moment when you have to kind of make that choice, do I face the fact that I might be wrong or do I deny it and just try to look for defenses of my position? You have this one built-in incentive tempting to you to go down the soldier route, which is that like you want to avoid the pain of being wrong. But if you're one of these people, you also have this counteracting incentive of getting to feel the kind of self-satisfaction and pride that you're you're living up to the standard that you've set, set for yourself and you're kind of, yeah, you're upholding the values that you really care about and you want to see more of in the world. Um, and so you, you actually do get to feel good in that moment when you realize you were wrong. Um, you may also feel bad because it's just uncomfortable to be wrong, but at least like you have this other thing that, that can uh, sweeten the deal and and make the temptations of soldier mindset less uh, less compelling in the end. So I do think that sense of pride is really important in a lot of cases. Um, that was like a recurring theme again and again. Mm. We we did a series of films a couple of years ago now based on. So uh, I, I trained as a counselor, and there's a there's a school of uh, counseling called somatic experiencing. Are you, are you familiar with with that? So it's it's based on it's, it comes out of trauma work initially, and it's based on an understanding of something called polyvagal theory, which is how the vagus nerve moderates our arousal effectively. Like we're either in a defensive frame of mind or an open frame of mind, which seems to map on to scout and soldier mindset quite well. But in that, and it's it's really about how we integrate trauma or how we um, how when we're defensive, we we're pretty much locked into uh, an oppositional mindset. We start seeing other people as being threatening. We, we're, we're, we're literally un unable to take in new information. Whereas when we become curious, and this is one of the things that we, we talk about quite a lot, is like, can you, when you start feeling defensive, can you become curious about your defensiveness? Because that actually can start to shift our, shift our state into a more open, uh, engaging social state, which, is, which, again, is moderated through the vagus nerve. Um, it seems to map on very well. I, I, I can maybe send you the film to have a look at because it, it's a fascinating, um, yeah, it's a fascinating theory that, that seems to map on to, to yeah, that, that we're in a, we're sort of binary creatures. You, you can't be what, you can't be in both at the same time. We have to be in one or the other. Interesting. Yeah. You know, one thing that I didn't really talk about in my book that some people said should have been in there was this kind of mindfulness, not of like, not of the content of your thinking, but of your physicality, your, your, you know, whether your body is tense or, or whether you feel open, uh, whether your heart rate is elevated or not, um, just sort of how, how you feel in your body. Um, point being that this can be a really good signal about whether you're in scout mindset or soldier mindset and and that that manipulating that aspect of your psychology can can help you be more in, in scout mindset. 
Um, so this may well be true. Um, I would I would not be at all surprised if this was like true and important. I didn't put it in there because I personally am not that great at. For, for me, the the more useful cues are mental cues and not physical cues. Like noticing, oh, I mentally flinched away from that thought, or oh, I I reflexively reached for. Uh, a rebuttal instead of thinking about what they were saying. I can notice those things. I'm less good at really noticing the physical cues. And I also, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are, they just don't like, if you, if you ask them to notice when they're physically in a defensive mode, they're not going to notice that. And so I was just trying to pick a, uh, I was trying to pick advice that would be more kind of generally useful to people because it seems like this skill of strong physical awareness and and being able to connect those physical cues to what's going on in your mind might just be something that some people are much better at than others. Uh, and so I didn't want that to be the the thing that I hang my thesis on, if that makes sense. Do you find that, by the way? Do you find natural variation in how like physically... Yeah, I was going to ask, it's interesting you mentioned about the kind of embodiment piece, because I was going to ask, what are the criticisms of the book that you think have got some validity? Yeah, so to some extent, I I tried to understand and anticipate and preempt a bunch of criticism. So like, to some extent, my book is already written <laughs> as a, um, you know, right, right. So like my you know, I talked to a lot of people as I was writing the book and, you know, floated my thesis to them and got their thoughts and uh, and objections. And so a lot of that is already addressed in the book. Um, so, for example, there's a bunch of chapters in there about hesitations or objections people have to the idea of being more of a scout. Um, one is that confronting the truth or seeing things realistically, it'll just demoralize you. And there's no, you know, there's no point in, in doing that. You might as well just kind of only look at the positives. Um, another kind of objection is that trying to see things accurately will make you seem less confident because you're, you know, you're going to be aware of all this uncertainty and you're, you know, you can't necessarily proclaim your beliefs with as much certainty as you did before. And you're aware of all the potential downsides in your plan. And you, so you can't just advocate for it with your, you know, wholeheartedly. Um, and so to be a strong leader, you need to just be, you know, totally confident in your beliefs and your plans uh, even if that confidence isn't warranted. So that's another kind of objection. And I, you know, give my reaction to all of these objections in the book. Uh, one kind of criticism I've gotten that I didn't really preempt in the book is about the, uh, the type of evidence that I use. So I originally, I kind of wanted to write a book that was just brimming with citations to research in in cognitive science and behavioral economics. Um, and I spent, I spent way too long writing this book. And like a large chunk of that time was spent just reading paper after paper, looking for evidence about the things that I was talking about in the book. And I just ended up feeling like, I, I just don't think I can trust the vast majority of this research. Um, like either it was either the papers were kind of small sample size, like college students doing some contrived thing in a lab and the authors, the researchers like generalized from that to some, you know, grand statement about human nature. And I, I just don't, like, don't buy that. Or, or like when you read the methodology sections of the papers, they're just not very well designed experiments. They're not actually testing the thing they claim to be testing. Um, like the, the, the survey questions I ask people are badly designed and I don't think they're capturing what what the researchers wanted to capture. Anyway, there were just a bunch of reasons why I just didn't feel like we should update very much from these papers. And, you know, to some extent, other, other kind of popular science authors are coming around to the idea that social psychology or like social science in general and psychology in particular is not, you can't just like trust a paper just because it comes to some conclusion but they still cite a lot of papers. They just kind of have this caveat about like, well, you know, there's a replication crisis. So like, we can't know for sure that all of these papers are correct. But I think my view is much more radical than that. It's like, I don't think we should even be citing the vast majority of these papers. You know, I, I think it's kind of misleading to cite them 
and then just have a little footnote about how like, well, you know, of course, it's not guaranteed. I think you're still kind of giving your readers the sense that the science is really trustworthy. And, uh, you know, the, the, these claims I'm making in the book have been proven with science. And I don't think that's warranted. And so I, I eventually decided, you know, the kind of book that I can feel confident writing and like, the kind of claims I can feel confident in are, are not claims like science has proven this thing about reasoning or whatever. They're claims like, look, here's a pattern that I have found in talking to people. Um, so here's a like technique that many people have found useful. You might find it useful too. Or, uh, you know, here's a, here's a feature of human psychology that I think you will, will be obvious to you if you look for it. I will point out a pattern and you will, you know, that will help you notice like, oh yeah, people are sometimes more truth seeking than other times. That's true. I wasn't paying attention to that. Those are the kinds of things I think a, a nonfiction book about psychology can do legitimately. Um, and, and that can be very useful and like, you know, original and helpful to people. Um, but that's very different from writing a book that's, that claims it's showing you what science has proven about psychology. And anyway, so I, I eventually wrote the second kind of book and I did get a bunch of people complaining that it wasn't scientific enough. And so now I kind of wish I had been clearer in the book about why I wrote it this way and, and why I think that's a more intellectually honest way to write a book about psychology. And talking about dodgy scientific conclusions, I know you've um, spent a bit of time, I think, on your last podcast looking at the, de the debate around ivermectin, and some of the some of the topics that are kind of yeah hugely controversial at the moment, and obviously where the kind of rubber meets the road for making sense and trying to understand what's going on. What 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 did you conclude through that? So on my last podcast, well, I don't know when this is coming out, but uh, as of today, my last podcast is with Kelsey Piper. Um, oh, my my podcast is called Rationally Speaking, by the way, so you can look it up. Um, Kelsey Piper is a journalist who I really respect. Um, she's just a very careful, nuanced thinker, um, really does a good job of looking into evidence and, and evaluating it carefully. And so I was interviewing her to get her take on, on not just object level questions about like, should you take ivermectin, you know, to prevent COVID, um, but also on just general principles for how to think about complicated um, uh, problems like, like COVID. Um, how do you evaluate evidence? How do you adjudicate when different experts are saying different things? Um, to what extent should you be trying to do your own research versus just trusting what your chosen authorities tell you? Um, these are complicated questions. It's, uh, so someone on Twitter said that COVID has made, um, epistemologists of us, of us all. <laughs> like COVID has, COVID has kind of forced us all to be in the role of, you know, having to think about how do I find truth? Um, not that you don't have to do that in other parts of your life, but it's just very, been very stark with COVID um, because the, the evidence has been so shifting and often uncertain and complicated and important. Um, I forget your question. D did I answer it? I, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very, yeah, I think I like that idea that, that it's been a, an epistemological test for all of us. I guess my, my, my question was, what did you conclude by looking into yeah from your from your podcast with with Kelsey. Oh yeah, so I haven't personally looked into the evidence nearly as much as Kelsey has. Um but she had some uh I thought very astute takeaways from her investigations. Um so on the object level, uh what she said about the various potential covid treatments was um so ivermectin there's really not great evidence um, to suggest that it is at all helpful. Uh, there's certainly not good evidence that it uh, helps in treating COVID. There had seemed to her to be a little bit of maybe suggestive evidence that m it might help prophylactically, like if you take it to hopefully prevent COVID. Um, so yeah, she had she had concluded that yeah, it's not very well proven, um, but it's there's not nothing there. That was her that was her view. And then after we taped the podcast, she emailed me and said actually. I've been working on a new story for Vox, which is where she writes. Um, she writes for a section of Vox called Future Perfect. Um, she said, I've been working on a new story and I've been kind of looking into these studies on ivermectin more. 
the, the studies that had seemed to find a positive effect prophylactically. And she said, I'm, I'm no longer sure these studies are actually legit. Like, it now seems to me that the experiments described in the studies may not have even happened at all. I'm finding all of these red flags and warning signs. And so, so I want to retract my, my, like, very slight tentative support for, for ivermectin and now say, like, I don't think we have any reason to believe it helps even prophylactically. Uh, so hopefully that article will come out soon because I want to see the, the details about <laughs> the... Um, shocking fraud in the ivermectin world um but i i appreciated you know not just the like object level advice but but the general practice that kelsey demonstrates of um you know updating her position as she learns more information mm. yeah and i've obviously had quite a lot of personal experience of how passionate the discussions around these topics can get especially especially around vaccines i think because i think everyone rightly feels they've got a a stake in that and and people are finding their friendships tested, finding some of their family relationships tested, depending on their views on that. Um, do you have any, any thoughts about skills or tips that people can have for navigating some of those conversations or some of that landscape better? Yeah, I mean, probably the key thing is we tend to, we, a lot of people tend to adopt a very kind of, smug attitude when it comes to topics like vaccines where they're very confident they're right and the other side is wrong and and they're just kind of incredulous that anyone could be wrong about this like how could you possibly think vaccines cause autism or how could you possibly think that you know there's a government conspiracy to uh hide the truth about ivermectin from you or, or whatever and so when they're ostensibly trying to persuade the other side um like talking to a friend who doesn't trust vaccines or or if you're a journalist writing an article explaining why vaccines are actually safe and helpful um when they're ostensibly trying to persuade their tone is so just smug and dripping with self-righteousness and kind of implicitly or explicitly mocking the views of the people they're trying to persuade um and it's just completely ineffective. Um, all you're doing when you talk like that is just feeling good about yourself and maybe, you know, pleasing other listeners who already agree with you and like, you know, hearing the other side mocked. But you're you're not going to make progress on changing other people's minds, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and so one example that I like, um, that I gave in my book, was someone, it was, he's a journalist, um, and he used to have this kind of attitude about the anti-vaxxers. He couldn't understand how anyone could be that stupid, um, and he kind of mocked them a lot. And then he got to know an anti-vaxxer personally and uh, and ended up marrying her. And so he's, he kind of had more incentive than he used to to sort of listen to her and understand where she was coming from. And it wasn't that he ended up thinking she was right, because he still thinks she was wrong, but because he was trying, he started to understand, okay, I can see why she believes this thing, and it doesn't make her stupid or crazy. Like, she had had a bad experience with the medical establishment when she was younger, so that gave her some suspicion that, you know, they were reasonable or had people's best interests at heart. Um, she, The sources of information that she trusted um, all insisted to her that vaccines were dangerous. Um, and he was like, well, it's, you know, I think they're wrong, but I, I think it's a, it's a practice we all engage in. We just, we listen to the sources that we trust and, you know, put more weight on those opinions. And so she's just doing what all of us do. It's just that her sources are telling her something I think is wrong. Um, and, and he also started to notice, you know, there are examples of the medical establishment being wrong in a dangerous way. Um, I'm forgetting the exact example that he gave um, in his story, but you can you can find examples of of the medical consensus shifting. And so the idea from the anti-vaxxers that you know maybe the medical establishment is just you know wrong or misleading us about the safety of vaccines it's not it's not made up out of whole cloth. Like I think if you actually look into it it's pretty clear that that's not what's happening with vaccines, but the idea that that could happen is not crazy. Anyway, so he kind of came to understand how this belief could seem reasonable to someone even if it's not true. And he sort of talked to her at that level and and acknowledged all of the points that were reasonable about her belief, even while saying he disagreed. 
And she did end up changing her mind within a couple of years um, of talking to him. She decided, okay, I'm going to get my daughter vaccinated this year <laughs> for the first time, um, which was great. And so in my experience, that kind of way of engaging with other views, even other views you think are, you know, completely wrong and actually harmful to the world, um, that's just a much more effective way of talking to people. And I think also better for you, like better for your own epistemic health uh, than focusing on how stupid and irrational the other side is. And was there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to mention before we finish the interview? Well, I guess one thing I want to make sure comes across is that, so I think it's very valuable to sort of shift away from soldier mindset and towards scout mindset, both on, you know, personal issues about the way you think about your own life decisions um, and about how you view yourself, also about politics and ideology and uh, nutrition and, you know, the other kinds of questions you have to tackle. I think it's really valuable to, to be more of a scout. Um, but I don't want people to think that the goal is to be a perfect scout and you should, um, you know, anytime you notice that you, you know, were wrong about something or were less than perfectly objective that you failed, um, because that is a completely unrealistic standard. <laughs> like changing your built-in psychological habits is a long process and you should feel good about yourself if you can make even a little bit of improvement um, over time. Like that should be the goal that we're setting for ourselves, uh, not perfection. Um, and a corollary of that is that when you do notice yourself, you know, getting something wrong or being defensive, you know, reaching for a rebuttal instead of listening to what someone is saying, you should not feel bad about yourself. You should feel good about yourself for having noticed because the self-awareness is, is one of the big challenges of becoming a better scout. Like even noticing that you were engaging in soldier mindset is a, a step in the right direction. And most people, you know, don't even take that step very often. So you should definitely feel good about yourself. And as a side benefit, if you feel good when you notice these, uh, signs of soldier mindset, you're more likely to notice because you're kind of emotionally rewarding yourself for noticing. Um, so that can be a positive feedback loop as well. Julia, thank you very much. For... <laughs> My pleasure. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.